let me get started. My topic today is about uh, music and wearable computing for health and uh, rehabilitation. Well, and I'm going to actually present the both more positive and uh, uh, also some negative examples so that um, um, colleagues in this community can learn something from it. I will divide my talk into three parts. First of all, the motivation. What motivated me to put the seemingly unrelated music and a wearable computing in a closed loop system to address a societal need? Second, wearable music and the sensors for motor functions. We have a series of uh, research projects in this theme. I'm going to illustrate the, our experience to you and how wearable music and sensors can work hand to hand um, to improve human motor, uh, motor functions. Finally, I will provide some reflection that I've learned and that during this entire journey, some key insights to share with the community. So what have attracted me to this particular unchattered water? I wanted to mention, first of all, the NUS Graduate School for Integrative Science and Engineering, which was a new graduate school for cross-disciplinary research. Second, I happened to meet and attend Dr. Patsy Tang's talk, and she's from Singapore General Hospital, who presented the neurologic music therapy in our university, and also its significant manpower requirement. This really and, um, triggered my interest in, in this direction and motivated me to explore technical solutions to solve and to address these challenges. Then so we have three strong faculties in computing, music, and medicine. I thought this could be a nice niche for me to explore and to work on. This journey straight for about 15 years, started from 2005. And uh, we played around with uh, three major platforms. First of all, mobile phones, then wearable sensors. Very recently, the earbuds. For this line of research, I really need to acknowledge my former employer, Nokia. As you know, Nokia used to be the world leader in the feature of phones. When I joined Nokia, before my um, work and uh, before joining National University of Singapore, I mainly focused on audio compression, including MP3 technology in Nokia Research Center. As you know, at that time, telephone, including mobile phone, belonged to the telecom industry. On the other hand, MP3 is a technology for the music industry. When we worked actually to combine and integrate these two things into one, which becomes a multimedia form, this already blurred the boundary between the telecom and the music industry. From that time on, the mobile phone is not just a box for talking to each other, but an entertainment platform as well. So I had this luxury to work with uh, microphones and the speakers. They are related to music technology, to uh, music processing, of course. Then in 2005, I got the first donation from Nokia which allowed me actually to play around with the Bluetooth signals and the IMU sensors. Why is that? Because we try to explore this kind of capability to convert a normal feature form 
to become a music instrument. At the same time, the touchscreen-based smartphone started to emerge, first with the iPhone, then with Android phone. We actually played around with all these major platforms and with the focus on algorithms and software. Our application domain at that time was mainly about entertainment and education. Education today is still a major research focus in my lab, but today's talk, I will focus only on the healthcare application. So these three major time, uh, the jam and juncture, I wanted to mention is that 2005, we got the first donation from Nokia. And in 2012, we started working with wearable sensors. And just very recently, we started to work with these earbuds, right? So these middle parts uh, started with a grant from ASTAR in Singapore in collaboration with Summit grant and, uh, in the United States. This allowed me to collaborate with the clinicians like Dr. Gottfried Schlock in Harvard Medical School and Dr. Ng Yesim from the Singapore General Hospital. Uh, I had my first PhD student, Dr. Zhu Sen Gao, to work in this direction for the very first time. That is an uh, excursion that we played around with hardware and very intensively. This effort ended by the end of last year. I will tell you why, and we decided to end that as well. So this uh, is the picture of the sensor we have managed to develop ourselves. It's a very interesting and exciting journey. And by last end of last year, I got uh, the second donation from Nokia. This is the Essence earbud. It's, it seems to be a very interesting platform, again, to trigger new uh, kind of research. We have just started to investigate into this new platform, but we don't have any publishable result at this moment. So wearable sensors are typically employed for monitoring, but our work has a new dimension, probably interesting to this community, that is the musical computing, which helped us to form a closed loop system, not only about the monitoring and the sensing, but also treatment in, and the intervention. That's an interesting combination in my view. Now let me move on to the wearable music and the sensor parts for the motor functions. Well, I wanted to mention these three keywords, music, neuroplasticity, and the motor functions. Let's start with the music perception. This part is important if we are talking about a music perception. And these parts, including um, the outer ear, middle ear, and uh, the inner ear are the core component of uh, the human auditory system. Most of them can be approximated and modeled with uh, signal processing tools like filters and a Fourier transform. Then, uh, the, this first part was particularly important for audio compression algorithms. But when I moved to Singapore, I started to collaborate with the clinicians and then started to be interested in the brain, how it works. I learned a very important concept called neuroplasticity, which in the simple term meaning, um, our synaptic connections in our brain can be changed due to learning or training. That is actually the foundation behind the, the neurologic music therapy. Of course, from the computer science perspective, we have these artificial neural networks. And nowadays, 
even the deep neural networks, try to approximate and then mimic some functions in our brain. However, its capability is still far behind the real neural network in our brain. I believe that you agree with me. So that is the scientific foundation behind it, the curiosity there. But what really interested me is about the human capabilities, in particular, the motor functions. We worked, in fact, with a number of populations. First of all, we worked with the cochlear implant children. Then we worked with the stroke patients who suffer from, um, for example, uh, aphasia, difficulties to speak. But the third population we encountered are the um, patients with Parkinson's disease. In particular, they suffer the walking and gait disability. So later on, I will have a video demo to show you how music can train human gait. That was considered by many clinicians as a music miracle. Parkinson's disease patients typically suffer four major motor impairments, which will result in unstable gaits and the eventual falls, which are very dangerous and costly. So these are the four major motor impairments. Unfortunately, there is no cure for Parkinson's disease until now. What we can do is only to manage these symptoms to improve their quality of life. Rhythmic auditory stimulation, in short, RIS, is a clinically proven intervention, but it's very manpower intensive. How to make RIS intervention accessible and affordable is a question interested most at that time. So this, in this circle, or in the middle, is our Parkinson's disease patients. They need to do regular gait rehabilitation in order to maintain their quality of life. Typically, they have to do this in a clinical setting. Even in Singapore, most of them have to do that way. That is not very convenient and quite expensive as well. Even worse, during this COVID-19 lockdown, the need for tele-rehabilitation is even more prominent. Fortunately, with the collaboration from our clinical collaborators, I have formulated a framework which included two fundamental components from computer science point of view. First of all, the computerized music intervention I will focus on the Music RX and MIMES projects. Then the second part is the wearable sensor-based GIT assessment to quantify the outcomes to form a closed loop solution. I will and the highlight our IRIS project and a MANA project. Since uh, Parkinson's disease is a lifetime condition Adherence is a huge challenge. How do we motivate these people to do the rehabilitation daily at their comfortable home? It is an interesting but a challenging problem. To address this bigger challenge, we have decomposed the research problems to two major parts. Number one, is about a music computing, which covers from music, domain specific music search engine to automatic music composition. The second major component is wearable computing. In this context, we focused on the wearable sensors to quantify patients' motion, especially the gait. In this journey, 
then we had the luxury to explore several research community. And it's fundamentally different compared to my traditional research community, which was audio engineering society. Uh, that particular community has invented MP3 technology. Let me move on to our first project, which I consider personally as a success, called IRIS, which is a music enhanced exercise and a motor re rehabilitation tours, which is completely based on a smartphone platform. We basically used the IMU sensors on the phone to quantify the patient's gait. Then use this parameter to find a set of music. The summary of the story is as simple as that. The, we put the smartphone on the waist, like this. And then we try to find the right music and nothing is really simple. And we have managed to publish these results both in the computer science domain and in the medical venue. Here is a short video to illustrate how the system works. Parkinson's disease affects approximately 1% of individuals over the age of 60, or roughly 7 million people worldwide. This number will rise sharply as society continues to age. Parkinson's disease is characterized by a number of pronounced motor impairments, including tremor, rigidity, slowness of movement, postural instability, and gait freezing. Despite more than 50 years of research, a medical cure remains elusive. However, a well-supported, evidence-based intervention for the treatment of gait impairments in Parkinson's disease is rhythmic auditory cueing. During a rhythmic auditory cueing intervention, patients attempt to synchronize their movements with an auditory cue presented either as a metronome or music with a strong, steady beat. Here, the same patient seen previously shows a dramatic improvement in his ability to walk during self-administered rhythmic auditory cueing. However, rhythmic auditory cueing interventions have not been widely adopted due to limited access to personnel, technological, and financial resources. High quality measurement of gait performed in a clinical setting is typically performed using foot switch sensors, pressure mats, or motion capture cameras. To help scale up rhythmic auditory cueing for wider distribution, we have developed iRace, an iOS-based rhythmic auditory cueing evaluation mobile application to help quantify clinically relevant statistics associated with motor function iRACE has been designed with a number of flexible experimental settings, including the duration of each trial, number of desired events to collect per trial, and the type of auditory cue which is delivered. The touch screen of the mobile device is used to assess upper motor function during self-paced tapping, tapping that is synchronized to an auditory cue, tapping after the cue is removed, and tapping as rapidly as possible. The mobile device's built-in triaxial accelerometer and gyroscope are used to assess step time and step length during walking. The device is attached to the body at the navel using a chest strap. The mobile device records movement continuously during the self-paced walking, synchronization walking, and continuation walking, similar to the tapping tests. Novel machine learning based gait analysis algorithms have been developed for iRACE, including heel strike detection, step length quantification, and left versus right foot identification. The accuracy of iRACE derived gait statistics has been evaluated using concurrent validity by recording gait simultaneously with iRACE, heel mounted foot switch sensors, and a clinic standard pressure sensor mat in a sample of 10 Parkinson's patients. Preliminary results reveal that iRACE quantifies both average step time and average step length, as well as step time and step length variability, with margins of error that are acceptable for clinic use. In addition to further experimental testing in both Parkinson's patients and healthy elderly adults, future work will incorporate iRACE into a cloud-based network to facilitate data collection and data sharing, 
and provide integration with commercially available streaming music services to dramatically expand the range of candidate rhythmic auditory cueing stimuli. We hope that this combination of portability, accuracy, scalability, and customizability will lead to better characterization and, ultimately, treatment of motor impairments in Parkinson's disease. I consider this line of research a truly um, interdisciplinary research. We have included actually computer scientists, psychologists, and um, neuro neurologists and uh, rehabilitation doctors in this effort. So I would like to summarize. This is a mobile phone, smartphone based system and solutions. What is the pros and cons of a smartphone based system then? We can find, for example, the pros are the smartphones are simply off the shelves. Hardware, very easy to, to have. And we can simply use the API to do the programming and both the sound and the IMU sensor processing can be done on the same devices. However, there are also some cons. For example, the limitations on placement. We cannot simply put a, the smartphone into our shoes. And accuracy in measurement is also limited. And a redundancy and inefficiency, what I mean is here, what we really need in the Git quantification and assessment is just the IMU sensors, a very small component of a smartphone. The question naturally becomes, can we simply put these IMU sensors into a sensor board, an independent sensor board? This will make the solution much, much cheaper. We did not consider to develop our own hardware in the beginning. Instead, we tried to find out whether there is anything available in the market so that we can directly use and programming on it. We started with the fitness tracker, like Fitbit. These kind of devices are very cheap, very portable and wearable, but unfortunately, the accuracy is not very high for clinical applications. Then we also find a few solutions in clinical Git assessment, such, a light, such um, as these kind of devices. They are portable and pretty accurate, but unfortunately quite expensive. Even more expensive is this kind of equipment called a GitWrite, which is a um, common standard used in the hospital environment. Unfortunately, it's very expensive, more than $60,000 at that time. But if we wanted to develop anything like this, it is necessary to have a ground truth, an accurate ground truth. So we saw at that time a gap between this commercial fitness tracker and the clinical gated devices. Indeed, it was 80 years ago, not many uh, options available at that time. So in discussion with my collaborators and students, we decided to venture into this domain and then to manufacture the sensors by ourselves. These are the sensors that we managed, managed to prototype. The entire system, in fact, is quite complex, including the sensors, the smartphone app, and also the server app. One thing I wanted to highlight, we tried very hard to find out where we can put the sensor to do the accurate quantification of gait. We started with the hill, and then we showed this uh, um, prototype to our uh, clinical collaborators. And he basically believes that is not a very good idea to make the sensor very visible. So suggest that we could actually embed the sensors into the shoes so that it's completely invisible. 
that is so called invisible technology here, what we call it. And uh, the data flow starts from the sensor, then it's sent to the smartphone on the patient's body. Then this will be transmitted wirelessly to our sensor, uh, to our server. This data will be visualized to the doctors and the patients. So with these small sensors, we can be very flexible in terms of the placement. For the data collection we did later on, we used five sensors on four limbs and one on the trunk. So this is the clinical setup for us to do the clinical trial. At that time, when we planned this clinical trial, we have not managed to secure a get right devices. Instead, we have developed our own computer vision based um, map somehow to replace the golden standard like this. Here is a healthy subject going on the map with the five sensors on. As you can see, the um, gait is quite normal. Now, let me look at a Parkinson's disease patient's gait. Pay attention to that. There is a significant difference. Now is get freezing. And our clinical assistant that tries to protect the patients in case the patient falls. Shuffling and so on. As you can see, the gate is very unstable. This data is sent to our server, but unfortunately, this raw data are not very useful to clinicians. How to compute reasonable and meaningful clinical outcomes is another research problem. Here, I will show you how we try to use music to in, um, enhance the patient's gait. Here, the um, blue curve illustrates the, the music waveform. The blue arrows above indicate the, the position of a music beat. Then we try to measure the gait. And here the animation shows we can measure in real time the time interval, step time interval from the gate right, for example. If we put more steps there, we can put these dots together to compute a clinical outcome measure, the coefficients of variation, which is a very meaningful one for clinicians. This is computed like this. In this particular case, for the healthy subject, we got a number 1.57%. What does this number mean? If we compare this number with the Parkinson's disease patient's gate, then you will see immediately the difference. So use the single clinical outcome measure, you can distinguish a healthy subject and the Parkinson's disease patients. And this figure shows clearly the variation of the patient's gait. Another important outcome measures include the step length and the step width. It is quite a challenge to compute them uh, with wearable, sens wearable sensors. For the step time interval, it is even possible to use Fitbit, this kind of commercial devices to measure. However, the step length and width are much harder to compute. This become a research focus of my students' work. The details of this particular clinical trial was published in these two papers. In a research community, it was also quite new to us. Uh, it's uh, ACM uh, sick 
Access, the Conference on Computers and Accessibility. Later on, we have tried to integrate a completely new sensor called ultra wideband sensors into our sensor board. It has a very different characteristics if we use it to measure the, the gate parameters. We did a data collection with NUS students and published the result in last year's UBICOM. That is, was the opportunity for me to learn to meet so many colleagues in this com in the research community. This figure, I wanted to show you the relationship between gate variability and fall risks. According to this study, these uh, two parameters are clearly correlated, meaning increased gate variability will result in increased fall risks in Parkinson's patients. Um, then how can we decrease the gate variability? in Parkinson's disease and facilitate their long-term gait rehab. Our solution is to leverage on the power of music for joyful gait rehab. However, not every piece of music is equally suitable for gait rehab. For example, a stable music tempo is a critical clinical requirement. Remember, the music beat is used to stabilize the patient's gait. If the music tempo is not stable, it can be quite dangerous. Now, let me show you two examples. Of course, and this is another music waveform, including uh, the red arrows indicated the, uh, the beat positions. We have tried to study in a huge music data set, how many songs are actually stable from the beginning to the end in terms of music tempo. And this uh, can be quantified using a parameter called interbeat interval, meaning we compute the distance between individual music beat. This song, as you can see from this figure, it is pretty stable. Good. At least uh, that particular song requires the basic requirement for RIS rehabilitation. But uh, this song is a beautiful one. I will show you uh, a few sections of the song. The first section sounds like this. The second section is very similar. So we'll skip that in the interest of time. The third section is very interesting. Let's see. Is this piece of music suitable for us based to get rehabilitation? Of course not, because it's it simply does not satisfy the clinical requirements. Well, since it is difficult to find a personalized music for RS-based rehab, and uh, do we have a better solution? So that is why we have studied a new direction called automatic music composition. That is still a project in progress. And I wanted to show you um, how the baseline model works. We try to compose a piece of music with a hierarchical structure, starting from the tempo, which matches the patient's cadence, basically how many steps they can walk per minute. Matching 
the music tempo, how many beats per minute. Then we generate the drum, the chords, the bass, finally the melody. So now let me show you a quick demo. Here is just a drum. Or join. Space join. As you can see, with this kind of structure, it's quite flexible for us to control any of these components here. Since we have not yet published this result, and also in the interest of time, it's difficult for me to explain the details here. Then finally, we have also tried something called a motion initiated music ensemble with the sensors. We try to use the wearable sensors as a music instrument. How do we do that? We do real-time gesture recognition. We map these gestures to different sound. And we use wireless transmission to communicate between the sensors and the speakers. And finally, the real-time sound synthesizer. We have managed to build the uh, prototype, even used it for a real music concert. However, I wanted to show you that is not an easy thing to do. There are still a lot of challenges. Let me show you very briefly a demo of the first prototype. One, two, three, four, one. I have a dream, a song to sing, to help me go with anything. If you see the wonder of a fairy tale, you can take the future, even if you fail. I believe in angels, something good in everything I Yes. As I explained before, we used the uh, wearable sensors um, as a music instrument here, except the singing voice, all other sounds are basically generated because of the, the gesture, because of the motion of the hand and of the feet. My music still has a lot of technical challenges in terms of real-time performance and reliability, because in this kind of application scenario. These are very important requirements. Now let me move on to the final parts. Some reflections. What we have learned from this exploration? First of all, the bar for such kind of interdisciplinary research is very high. We need clinical collaborators, very smart uh, driving students, and the grants. All must be in place. A lot of overhead will occur for such kind of research project. IRB applications, subject recruitment, and so on. This could be quite scary to many CS students, computer science students. Developing our own wearable sensor, this MANA sensor, was a decision without a very thorough SWOT analysis. I will explain two, present two different assessment of my own assessment, basically. Is our MANA sensor project a success or failure? Very much depends on what kind of evaluation metrics we are using. Ideally, well, this is the, the Pareto 80-20 principle. Uh, the idea is that 80% uh, of our results are from only 20% of our effort. The green line illustrated the 
ideal case, I would say our IRIS project almost satisfies this requirement. With a decent effort, we have achieved a very nice results that is based on a smartphone platform. However, the, our MANA project, the situation looks like this. What is the implication? We put a lot of effort, but not a lot of output in terms of publication. Very frankly, the overload overhead is far beyond my expectation. The consequence is that the project consumed 80% of our lab's resource, but only produced less than 20% of our publications. Of course, in this criteria, this is a failure. However, I wanted to present also in a positive light. If we consider the personal growth as the result, we don't mind to put more effort. What is the consequence then? Both my students and myself had a very steep learning curve to do a lot of things from hardware, software, and algorithms development. And also we honed our communication skills, communicate with clinicians, and so on. So we not only just publish a few papers, but also patent, and even a many more viable products. My PhD student even set up a startup company to capitalize our team's multi-year research into a commercial product. This project involved two PhD students and a five FIP students who finished their degrees all. In short, this unique journey has significantly broadened our horizon and allowed us to see big pictures and connections. I will use a quick example to show you what do I mean this connection and a big picture. Here is the first signal. This is a music signal. It is typically studied in a community called Izmir for music information retrieval. The two other signals are studied in completely different research communities. So that is the, uh, after an, our analysis, this is the detected result of music beats. Here is the second signal. It's a human gate. We can do similar processing and get a result. That is the steps. Finally, this is the heartbeat. We can also do similar analysis of this particular signal. If we remove the original signal, these are the, all the outcomes. We can use similar time series analysis and statistics to analyze them. For example, to compute the correlations between the music beat and the gate to see whether our music intervention is useful at all. This almost conclude my journey by combining music and wearable sensors. During this investigation, we saw a lot of connections, meaningful connections. We started with a real clinical need and I developed novel technology to address that. But then our technology, when put in use, also cultivates the, for the need for technical solutions. This also forms a closed loop. When we put music and a wearable computing in one box, it really helped us to see and the, out of the box. Look into the future. I wanted to mention the second donation 
from my former employer, Nokia, which always provided me a lot of inspirations to work on interesting things. That is the donation from Nokia Bell Labs in Cambridge, United Kingdom. Uh, we just started to look into the new platform this year. I hope in the near future, we have some interesting results to report to this community. With this, I wanted to thank my current and former students, collaborators, and funders. These are my students. The first two are the students that directly worked on the sensor projects. One of them now work in the world leading technology company as a research leader. The other one works as a faculty member and also studied his own company to capitalize on our sensor research. These are my collaborators. Most of them are clinicians, including Dr. Gottfried Schlock, who is a neurologist. Dr. Ng is a um, movement disorder specialist. Dr. Wang Jian is also a neurologist. And Dr. Patsy Tang is a music therapist. So I also would like to thank my funders, including Nokia, Minister of Education in Singapore, ASTAR, and the um, National Research Foundation in Singapore. Without fund, there is no fund.